Hi, Ken here, just popping in quickly before the show starts. Um, there's going to be a couple of confusing points in this episode, uh, mainly because we recorded this one prior to the, including the intro and outro prior to our interview with Carl Abramson, which was uh, the reason we put that one out first was because his book had just come out, uh, the Anton LaVey book, and we just thought it'd be timely to put an episode out at the same time. So we sort of switched the episodes around, did an old switcheroo, and uh yeah, so you're going to hear a couple of things that might not make sense. Like Part one is that I keep referring to it as episode 64, when it's actually episode 65. Um, secondly, I mentioned the competition, which has now ended, uh, the competition to win Tobias Churton's Alistair Crowley in England book. And actually, we have a winner of that now, um, Amber, uh, who has already been informed and sent me um, the address to send the book to. So congratulations, Amber. Um, and yeah, so hopefully that clears up some confusion to regular listeners. Um, and now back on with our scheduled programme. Hello there and welcome to episode 64 of Right Where You're Sitting Now. Um, returning to what he may believe is his rightful throne, I don't know, um, the usurper himself, <laughs> um, Mark Satir. How are you doing, sir? Very good, thank you. And, um, and uh, you know, as I always say, you know, the, the, the true spirit, well, the, the spirit of sitting now is that it does provide a variety of voices and attitudes and uh, opinions and opportunities to, to hear those not necessarily take them on board but who knows where they might lead you and so it's it's, it's very good to it's going to be very good to be here and it's very good to hear other people as well other people i respect actually oh, i've got to say i was trying to create a sort of uh, a rivalry tension. yeah tension and tension. rivalry drama yeah. for the uh, Anyway, um, so yeah, so I think by the time this episode comes out, I, I've extended. It's getting desperate now, Mark. I'm, I, I've I've extended the Tobias Churton uh, competition. So if you want to win a copy of Alistair Crowley in England for free, sent anywhere in the world, um, uh, give us a come to citynow.co.uk episodes. Look up episode sixty, Alistair Crowley in England with Tobias Churton. The uh, competition extremely easy competition uh instructions are there um and you can i mean i don't understand why more people haven't entered i think we've got like four or five now um considering how many listens we have that's that's kind of they're either extremely lazy or extremely disinterested in this book i can't quite figure out and i don't see why they would I be don't, i don't i do not think that's the case i think people sort of um enjoy and benefit from sitting now it, we're, we're, they don't join they they don't uh, sort of uh, you know tune in to to, to join in a, 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 a competition so but anyways but. oh okay so i'm obviously uh, doing something wrong but anyway this week we are covering a topic that uh is is of interest it's a topic that touches it it has tendrils that throw through most of the topics we we talk about on sitting now I, I would actually say if you think about the sort of um the pillars the the the, the foundations of the western esoteric movement uh, one of them one of them undoubtedly one of those core elements is is what we're going to talk about today yeah and returning to talk to us about that is uh um, Mark Stavish, who we had on a few week episodes ago, um, a very good guest that he is, and very given with his time again this week. Um, but the the topic we're talking about, of course, is is Freemasonry. Indeed, um, well, this this podcast stands between. Uh, I said pillars there earlier. Literally, it stand and and metaphorically, it stands between the dark and light period pillars that are found in front of all the true sanctuaries of the mysteries. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, and Freemasonry is, I mean, it's something we often bring up in, in 
casual conversation just because like i say it touches it it, co- it touches on so many different aspects it's influenced so much you know so it's going to be a really interesting episode um, mark stavish has written a book recently called um, the path of freemasonry um and we're going to be taking a look more specifically i suppose i mean a, a historical look a philosophical look and also an esoteric look in particular um uh with with mark so uh yeah enjoy that and uh, let's pop over to that now hello there mark stavish thank you so much for coming back on the show i really appreciate you giving us some more of your time oh well thank you very much for the invitation to return i'm I'm glad I didn't bore your listeners too much and that you've called me back. <laughs> anytime, anytime. Um, I think the first question, is, I mean, we're, we're, today we're talking in, about Freemasonry and in particular your book, The Path of Freemasonry. The um, uh, first question really is like, why did you write this book? What was the kind of, you know, the motivation behind it? Well, it, it is, of course, an updated version of uh, an earlier edition of the book that was published by Llewellyn in 2007, I believe. And I had written that book a few years after I had joined the craft. And uh, this is my 20th year of having been entered past and raised to the sublime degree of a master Mason. And uh, that will be in October, no, November, November of this year. And uh, I wrote it as a kind of workbook for myself, a tool, but also something to share with other masons because at that time we had one traditional observance lodge in the state of pennsylvania i think another one was being talked about but traditional observance lodges weren't being uh highly supported even though the movement was was growing and strong and much on demand because of the uh dan brown phenomena you know the the lost symbol and all of that and uh, I wrote the book to demonstrate to some of my brethren who, while well intended, were ill informed about the fundamental nature of Masonry's relationship to the broader culture, in particular, you know, the, the, um, the growing scientific movement at the end of the Renaissance, uh, as well as the builders' guilds and why that was. I mean, I think I give the example in the book that. You know, ask many an American Mason what G means, and they tell you God. You know, and you, you <laughs> say, well, that, that doesn't work out too well in French. No. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, it, it, what is the G all about? And, of course, we say geometry. But, uh, and then the other aspects, its relationship to esoteric movements, both before and after it. It, it has a interesting relationship to esotericism. Uh, so that being said, I, I, I wrote the book as a tool, how to begin to use these things because masonry is not very good at giving you practical working methods for all its tools, symbolism of tools. It doesn't really give you any on how to work with masonry. And it's a, it's a very, I, from reading it, I, I, it's a very digestible, you, you've managed to take quite uh, complicated and and uh, rich information when, and when I was reading it I was really struck by how in a, in a very methodical very approachable way you you've been able to allow the reader or you support the reader to digest that information I found that I, I found that very impressive actually well and thank you very much because uh, you sometimes when you when you're writing you, you do well and you know it and sometimes when you're writing, and it's really good, you know it. And uh, I think two occasions of that were, you know, my book on egregores. When that was done, it was said, so, "Well, this is done. This is just uh, let's not. If it ain't broke, don't fix it." You know. And the same was with the one on masonry because I was writing it for both the Freemason and those interested in masonry, but also the idea of masonry as a path for the non-Mason. That is the ideas presented in the book and their application don't require that you be a member of specifically a Masonic fraternity or a Masonic body. They're, they're equally applicable to a variety of Martinist, Rosicrucian, and, uh, and Templar bodies or Gnostic bodies as well, or even witchcraft in many ways. There's a, you know, the, the, the have an application to those involved in, in certain neo-pagan approaches. 
and and, and pagan revival, the, the the reconstructionist revival groups. Yeah, I yeah. Think... I mean, it's a, a I mean, a curious thing. Uh, Joel Gardner apparently he was a. Uh, uh, entered an uh, apprentice mason and he joined the sphinx lodge it wasn't in malaysia but it's in that kind of part of the world and if and in within wicca within the culture of wicca there's a definitely a flavor there's more than a flavor actually of yeah, uh, yeah, really. of, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah exactly and the the um somatic bees and so on and yes. um yeah and, and my understanding is also i mean it's just my understanding that uh, joel garden also had connections with other masonic bodies like the ordo temper tempi say it again ordo temperali oh, i say it again the OTO, OTO for sure, yeah, sure. Say, <laughs> I, yeah for some reason i get my teeth in i feel my, uh, my teeth are coming out. uh yes the oto that's easier to say isn't it that's less of a mouthful and um yes and uh, the, again you can see those the sort of masonic influences so um yeah, uh, yeah. So well, they're, they're... there lies the connection of Crowley to uh, contemporary witchcraft. That a lot of witches and Wiccans, Wiccans is an offshoot of that. And I know we're going far afield here, but uh, are unfamiliar with. But that's it. We are going far afield because it's easy. You notice how easy we went in three steps, four steps afield, because of the tight connection, the massive influence of masonic ideas masonic symbolism masonic literature just across vast aspects of primarily western but also global history yeah it's vast isn't it i mean it really is vast it's uh it sort of touches so many different uh like you say different kind of uh spiritual groups but you know it also touches into popular culture uh mm -hmm. it's you know it, it's uh it's definitely a very influential and uh and i think actually that in a way that's kind of there's that you know there's going to be a portion of our listenership and i only want to touch on this kind of you know a little bit more briefly i suppose but i do feel we should you know for those who have heard the term and maybe in their local town have seen a lodge um it would be interesting to you know just very quickly talk about freemasonry i thought one way of um you know in a more broad sense rather i thought one way maybe we could talk about your own um journey into freemasonry what was it that appealed to you and kind of what is freemasonry to you and you know uh, generally speaking what what is freemasonry and what was your kind of uh you know what what drew you to it well masonry is a big tent uh, however it is essentially a uh organization that is both philosophical excuse me philosophical and fraternal and charitable. Unfortunately, I said both because uh, I meant both in the contemporary sense, it tends to be mostly fraternal and charitable, at least in the United States. It is one of the largest charities that gives between one and $2 million a day to charity, particular children's burn hospitals through the shrine at no cost to uh, uh, the people receiving treatment. They even get picked up and dropped off and uh, that uh, lodg and lodgings are often provided for them. So masonry is a, a massive, quiet charity. It does not seek recognition for what it does and on any level. Uh, it does receive it, of course. You see pictures in the paper or news uh, print or news releases at different times or maybe in your media streams of uh, events. But that's OK. We, we don't go out of our way, though, to say, hey, look at us. We've raised money for this and that. It, it's just what we do. However, it is more than fraternity and it is more than charity. It is also philosophy. It is a philosophy that is behind all of that, which drives all of that. And that philosophical system is where uh, uh, much of the confusion comes in uh, because it's often lost or not well understood because it does not have a doctrine or a dogma. It has a set of symbols. It is, has a set of moral instructions and ideas, but you have to figure them out for yourself. Uh, you have to believe in the supreme uh, being, a grand architect. But what does that supreme being mean? Well, that can be very different for everyone. Uh, we see that, well, with the exception of the, the Grand Orient in France, that is. Uh, we see in all of these lodges that, that, that affirm statement. So what is your understanding of the supreme being? What is your understanding of that? Same with the symbols. Uh, and therein lies a little bit of a problem because 
because there isn't uh, often a direct instruction on what some of these symbols mean beyond this, the, the, the the limited notion of uh, the twelve ga- the, the the twelve gauge rule or the square and compass and and some clearly obvious symbolism behind this, uh, the more esoteric aspects uh, often do get lost or ignored completely, at least in Anglo-Saxon lodges. And that has been turning around, by the way, uh, within the United States and I believe Canada as well, but I'm not that familiar with it. We have uh, the traditional observance movement, which is going back to traditional methods of uh, uh, membership, meaning that you don't go through the degrees a degree a month for three months. And that was even during the colonial period that was possible. So that's not a new thing. But we just seem to do it faster for whatever reason. Now, here in the traditional observance, you have to wait a year between each degree. And you have to present a paper to the open body of the lodge. You know, your understanding of something Masonic. And that's a far more engaging um, um, involvement with the sort of the initiatory narrative, isn't it? It's far more, yes. far more. You know, you're, you're obviously you're going to get more out of it, and uh, and it's initiation in the in the in the you know fullest sense of the word to start again, isn't it? That's, that's True. literally what it, you know. And, and I think anyone who's seen a Masonic initiation, and and they have landmarks, which means things which they hold in common, but they can really be very different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction you're going to recognize it. If you're a Mason, you're going to recognize large pieces of it, but there may be things that you've never seen before. It's just not in your jurisdiction. It doesn't happen there. Uh, That said, within the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, which I reside under, uh, we have a spectacular education program, and I wish more men would take advantage of it. And we have men from out of state, other jurisdictions seeking it. Uh, twice a year, and I'll be going to it again this year. Uh, in Elizabethtown, they have the Academy of Masonic Knowledge, which world-class speakers present, uh, two speakers a day. And uh, and it's free to Masons. I'm, I'm sure if you're a non-Mason, you could probably just show up. I, I've never been asked for a card, you know, so I'm sure you could walk I in. I don't think you, you should be to. telling us and, that. <laughs> and they live stream it, too. You can often find it on, on YouTube recently because of COVID, oh, wow. which is wonderful. And... Uh, I think last year, uh, Chick Cicero was presenting. Of course, he's well known for his work within the Golden Dawn and some Rosicrucian groups. So the Academy of Masonic Knowledge of Pennsylvania is a spectacular group, and so is their scholars program. I can't say enough about it. And the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction is a f- spectacular group. And, of course, Art Hoyas wrote the introduction to my book, this one. And, and uh, Good friends of mine have just been elevated to their 33rds in the northern jurisdiction, and they keep asking me to get involved again because they said, look, the, the new Grand Master is just all about really good education. So, you know, it goes through cycles. I'm trying to make this clear that, you know, the, the organization is massive. In the United States alone, it's massive, let alone worldwide. So to try and make a statement of what Freemasonry is based on a local encounter or even a regional one or a national one uh, is always going to be partially in error. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, maybe one way of looking at it is, I mean, the two the two rights that I always hear of are the York right and the Scottish right. Um, so maybe could we sort of very briefly touch on the differences between the two? Like, what are they and what are the differences between the two? In, in the United States... Let me speak to that, because that's what I deal with on a regular basis. All of your jurisdictions, to my understanding, give the three degrees uh, in York right fashion, according to whatever jurisdiction they're under. Uh, No, 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 I'm wrong. Uh, It's only, excuse me, Pennsylvania... In Massachusetts, do them. The others do them a Scottish right uh, fashion. The York rights fashion of the three degrees is very simple. It's very clear and concise. Uh, the Scottish right is far more elaborate. And uh, the Scottish right, in terms of the fourth degree to thirty third, which is what most people are familiar with, is kind of like they like to call themselves the College of Freemasonry. 
Now, all Masons are equal, by the way. You need to understand that, regardless of degree. All Master Masons are Master Masons, and anyone who above that, all the degrees above that are simply, as we are told, an elaboration on the principles or points in the first three degrees. Now, you can argue that back and forth all you want. You can read, um, you can read, uh, uh, what is it, Albert Pike, and you re can read commentaries on Pike, uh, his morals and dogma and commentaries on the degrees uh, to get his sense of the esoteric foundation behind Freemasonry and Scottish Rite in particular. But at the end of the day, all of the men in those degrees are Master Masons. And they are undertaking ritual work that has a moral lesson behind it that needs to be understood. These are morality plays, these initiations. And they are to teach you about life and death. In York Rite, from the fourth degree and above, which goes to the 18th degree, I think, some of these change. See, a lot of these things change over time. And I, sometimes I might confuse a historical point with the current point. Those degrees are primarily Christian in nature and focus on the Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar are in Scottish Rite, too. But for whatever reason, whatever historical reason, these degrees focus on Knights Templar and the Temple of Solomon. And they're beautiful to watch. I mean, they're spectacular to see them performed and to participate in them. Mm. We'll definitely come back to the Templar thing a bit later yeah. because that's, uh, you know, that's uh, an int that's something we were discussing before the interview. Actually, we'd like to know some of the links there. Um, so, I mean, looking, you know, at the origins of of Freemasonry, one name kind of pops up, and that's Elias Ashmole. I was wondering if you could uh, talk because I mean, we, we were saying, you know, how mainstream Masonry does seem to sort of somewhat reject in some parts of mainstream masonry at least it does seem to sort of reject the kind of more esoteric origins and, and uh, practices of uh, freemasonry um elias ashmole seems to be a good starting point for looking at well, that well let me let me just stop you there and say the reason for the rejection is simple uh freemasonry is a large body and it reflects its community so when we opened up the doors in the post war period to become a very large organization. And even after the Civil War, the American Civil War, when it became a very, very large organization, uh, and it was dealing with the anti-Masonic period as well a little bit, I think there was some involvement there that, that caused people to, to want to shift away from things. When you, when you go big, you often find yourself at a point where you are shifting the intellectual dynamic. So the focus is on charitable work and fraternity because men in those days were the primary breadwinner. And many of these fraternities acted as insurance companies. And of course you see organizations like the Travelers Insurance Company that was started by Masons. You know, the Travelers, the Traveling Man. That's the question you'll hear, are you a traveling man? Okay, means are you a Mason? But you know you have to know the reply, not just the question. <laughs> There's sp specific replies, and uh, so you saw many people joining these organizations, it was, which was the high point of fraternalism in the country and in the world, really, at least in you know, Western world, uh, was to to join these organizations for the comfort that they might bring in case of, um, as a mutual aid society. Now, the fantastic building boom of masonry took place around that time as well because of the fantastic wealth that poured into it. And unfortunately, many of those buildings were not able to be maintained over the last 30 years, 20 to 30 years, and even the last 10 years in particular. So when we look at that movement away from esotericism or, uh, or philosophical views. Uh, I believe that happened very early in the United States in American masonry. I believe that to be the case. And not so much within European masonry. It's always been there to some more or less degree, the esotericism. Uh, even, if, even if it's kind of denied, it's denied rather than ignored. And in the, in the United States, it was ignored to the point where it became unknown. 
And, and I've had discussions with degree masters in Scottish Rite who, well, that's Southern jurisdiction. Like, okay, but it's still Scottish Rite. I mean, your degrees are slightly different, but you know, there'd be no Northern jurisdiction if it wasn't for the Southern. It wouldn't exist, at least in the United States, it is. So, um, you know, trying to get that through to them is, is very difficult or has been very difficult. But, you know, that's why things cycle through. And that's why we have the traditionalist observance uh, movement. We have the philosophical lodge movement. We have, uh, operate, uh, you know, opportunities for men who are interested to, to participate in the academy and, and those things which, uh, which have a, uh, a more intellectual appeal. Yeah, oh. I was going to say, and also we can add your you know, your very agreeable book is, is a sort of antidote to that, isn't it? It's a very it it, it it emphasizes. I was very surprised actually to read that. Well, in some ways surprised, in some ways surprised to to read that sort of um, regular masonry was sort of shunning or sort of sweeping under the carpet a bit the the more the sort of hermetic roots or the esoteric roots of... well, uh, not not even sweeping under the carpet simply don't even know they exist anymore and again this has to be understood understood in a very hard and difficult way this uh, we have a phrase that says guard you well the western gate and that applies to any group or movement or family even and uh, when you start opening the doors too wide because you're going after size at some point you're going to add too much water to the soup and that's really what happened and a lot of the individuals with more on the ball shall we say simply left yeah and i i would actually go so far as to suggest that you know the landmarks of masonry and one of the reasons why it survived and one of the reasons why we're sat here now talking about it and is because of the because of the um the deeply archetypal nature of those degrees and, and correct full agreement it, that's it and, and people know there's something spectacular about them i'll tell you i mean you you cannot go through them and be unmoved i've i've met men who haven't been in a lodge since they had their initiation, but they remember very specific things about those degrees because they're, they're deeply moving and very well done off. And even when they're not well done, they're well done. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's an experience so unlike what a young man and for young women, particularly if they're joining something like Droid Humane or, uh, co-masonry or one of those things uh, <clears throat> that were adoptive lodges that the um, the experience is so unlike what you will have in your day-to-day -day life yeah and the psychodrama of uh, initiation you know that the the, the uh, it gets under your skin it comes to life within you in a way that you you, you people can't you can't just get from a book. A book's going to go so far. We... It's not possible. It, it's yeah. simply not possible having because you can read the ritual all you want. You can watch the ritual on video from somebody who's either reenacted it or, or recorded it or something, you know, surreptitiously. However, it's not the same as the experience. And the experience is one which is often deeply moving as it's meant to be. And it has an effect on you. And that is a seed. And that seed can has the potential to be nurtured and to help you grow. And really, what is that seed? And that seed is represented in the this phrase, you know, we help make good men better. You know, so we're not like Yeats said about the Golden Dawn. It's not a reform school. Okay. We help good men become better. But what is that better? It is often a focus on the great question, why are you here? And what I mean by that is many people have seen pictures of it, the so-called chamber of reflection. Not all jurisdictions have them anymore. But the chamber of reflection was the first thing you, you entered into when you petitioned to be a member. You weren't a member yet. You were still petitioning to be one. And there is a possibility that you would be, that would be the night of your initiation, but they would vote on your membership and then you'd be initiated. And, uh, 
you know, you sat down in front of a skull, an hourglass, a mirror and a candle and a pen and paper and wrote your will. Now, the, some of the chambers are far more elaborate. They're very alchemical and they have more symbolism, but those are the basic symbols in it. And the question is, why do you want to join the fraternity, which is really asking, why are you here? Because this is a, an organization that could cost you your life. Now, Cagliostro was said to have been the, the last man sent to the prisons of the Inquisition because of his Masonic uh, affiliation. But there was an anti-Masonic movement in the United States in the mid-19th century. There have been various anti-Masonic movements. Uh, in 1933, I think it was, might have been earlier, might have been 32, but I think it's 33, um, you know, one of the first movements put down by the National Socialists was Freemasonry, as I was trying to tell my, my son earlier. And and then, of course, the communists just wipe them all out. The the fundamentalist uh, Muslims wipe them out every chance they get. Yeah, absolutely. But people do forget, you know, that uh, Freemasons were, t t were the victims in concentration camps and war inverted red triangles. And people people are surprised, actually. Uh, that that all part of the, the history is is sort of um, doesn't have the sort of focus that other parts of it do so yeah well because uh, the you're looking at maybe the numbers aren't even certain was it 200,000 was it 300,000 we're not certain I believe it's around 200,000 masons but even with that I mean I have letters here from the 1980s written to me by men uh, one is in German and he uh, was telling me how his friend successfully defend, defended uh, a mutual friend against charges of being a Freemason in East Prussia in the 30s. Now, at that point, Hermann Goring would have been the head of the Gestapo in East Prussia. So he successfully defended him in court against these charges. And other movements fell under those charges, too. Uh, prior to Action Hess in 1940, I think that was May, April, May 1940, um, somewhere in there, when Rudolf Hess uh, flew to Scotland for reasons never certain, or at least never publicly discussed, uh, there was a crackdown on occult publishers and bodies in Germany and occupied Europe at that point. Yeah, and um, that was. Go on, sorry. That's what triggered it. Yeah, and my and my understanding is uh, Karl Germer, who was uh, strongly linked with the uh, Temple of Oriental, I'll say it again, Order of Oriental Templars or the ATO. Um, he 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 survived the concentration camp, and uh, due to um, his associations with that body. And um, and in the end, he survived and he, he emigrated to New York. But uh, again, you know, that's a, a you know a fascinating you know living part of history there. Well, and Franz Barden, you know, he's he's reported to have been there as well prior to vanishing into the prisons of uh, the Czech Communist Secrets Police sometime in the 1950s. I think 53 it was somewhere in there. Uh, so. These movements have uh, always been suspect by totalitarian regimes. And do you, do you think, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, and I don't want to fuel the fan the flames of idiocy, um, but do you think that maybe some of these kind of um, early persecutions have kind of drifted into the modern conspiracy parlance a little bit? Well, I don't think they know of them because otherwise they wouldn't be thinking of the conspiracy uh, of masonry in that way. Um, you know, masonry, they look at it in terms of oh, the American Revolution or sometimes they try to pin the French Revolution on it. Uh, or we look at Garibaldi and the wars of Italian unification and some other places where masonry played a role or should I say masons played a role. And then sometimes Masonic lodges were used for meetings. Uh, we know that in Ireland often uh, with the IRA, but also at times in the South with the Ku Klux Klan. You know, it's a local thing. You, you can't control what locals do. You, know, you can just control who you let in. And, and this is where that, that problem comes in. Uh, people in an organization may be doing things that 
are illegal or unethical or immoral, but it doesn't mean the organization is doing it or supporting it or even knows about it, especially when it's a big body. So we say guard you well the Western Gate for that reason. I think within modern parlance, the problem of uh, Masonic conspiracy theories is that they're fundamentally stupid. And uh, I mean that in, in, the, in the technical sense of the word stupid. You know, it, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't really prove anything. They're, they're unprovable. Uh, even if you could prove it, what, what, what would it do for you? Uh, and it's always there's an excuse as to why someone who's telling you contrary information is wrong. You know, well, you don't know. Well, how do I not know? Well, you're not high enough. How do you know I'm not high enough? How many how many thirty thirds do you know? How many thirty thirds do you know? How many how many thirty seconds do I uh, do I am I or do I, you know, do you know? How many grand masters have you met? You know it's that type of thing, and then it's with them it's never any. Or they'll have one well, guy who said some strange thing about well this thirty second told me okay, so one guy tells you that makes it true. You know we we have a I say to anyone who's who's thinks that these conspiracies are real just join a lodge go see what happens for real also as well like if you take um the fixation on this 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 like, notion of uh, the illuminati in the conspiracy sphere it it's just a, the the word has been taken out of you know any kind of meaningful sort of historical or cultural context and it's just a hook to hang on something else some some fantasy some some fantasy about some you know some the you know something completely different well, i don't think robert anton wilson particularly helped with that i mean it, it, i love his book the illuminati trilogy but really i think that was what really pushed the illuminati into uh into the kind of conspiracy culture because he wrote a book that was fictionally about an illuminati conspiracy running the world and for some reason some certain people seem to think it was real <laughs> to took it a bit to, and all, um, well they have missed out on a the notion of irony mm -hmm. the and yeah, humor yeah, and yeah. humor humor and irony which aren't you know big with conspiracy theorists and, no. yeah, usually yeah all those all well, that the problem is people often want to believe well you know it, it's also the evil of egalitarianism You know, people think that they have a right to know what goes on in, in everything. You don't have the right to know. You, just because you don't know what's going on doesn't mean it's something that is nefarious. It's simply different, simply private. And, you don't ha and if you want to know, go join. Petition a lodge and join. But you don't have a right to know. Yeah, and often where there is the sacred, there is the secret. And there's a difference between... There's a difference between knowing and understanding. The The Internet is full of, you know, all intellect is paper and the Internet is full of words and, and uh, knowledge. But there's where is the understanding. And that, again, comes back to the, the lived reality, the lived experience of, say, initiation as an example, where 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 the those archetypes uh, you know, well, well, up, let's, just, to let's just look at it this way. I mean, you know, to, to address maybe some more philosophical points and, and move us even away from masonry. Uh, the, the notion is, is that there's good forces and bad forces, good and evil in, in the cosmos to some degree. And uh, that these have some degrees of, uh, of verifiability or at least uh, visibility of action. In, in the world in which we exist. And we've all met, well, hope, I don't know if we all have, I'm assuming we all have, we've met a variety of people who we know and trust and like, which are fairly good, and people who we even may know and trust and don't like, <laughs> who, are, or, who are evil or bad. Uh, I mean, I've worked with criminals, I've worked with very dangerous people, and uh, you, know, you have to say, okay, now if this person is dangerous on this level, uh, how much more dangerous would they be if they were smart, not just clever? Okay, and if they're really cunning, you know, what level of authority or power could they achieve? And are they not alone? And they form networks. So we call that organized crime. We call that terrorism. We call that uh, revolutionary movements, unless they're successful, then we call them uh, patriots. 
and so you have these things that go on. And then you have this notion of what is the connection to the invisible? And this is where it gets tricky because uh, we want to think of the cosmos as always being user friendly. And uh, maybe it is, but the cosmos is made up of these archetypal forces and qualities as well. And within those archetypal energies, as we've talked about in egregores, there's collective groups and they have agendas. And those agendas uh, are what we would call conspiracies. And the invisible isn't concerned with our notions of right and wrong for the most part. And when the invisible seeks a visible host, uh, it just seeks to, to full, it's fulfill its function. So you have various visible movements, churches, religions, esoteric groups, uh, philosophical groups, charitable organizations, uh, colleges, universities, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, PTAs, all of these things ultimately have a connection with the invisible, knowingly or unknowingly. And that's where this notion of conspiracy comes in, because people get a sense that there's more behind the curtain than they can see. They even know. They may know someone. I've known people who are in government and military. They have interesting stories they've said. Uh, interesting people I've met. And within that framework of what goes on behind the curtain. Well, when someone is very uncomfortable with the ambiguity, they need to fill in the blank. And then they'll often fill in the blank very concretely because they're being very concrete in themselves. Somehow they think that if they can fill in that blank, it'll erase the fear or the uh, unease that comes with not knowing. But it doesn't because even if the best and the worst conspiracy stories were true, and they probably are. So what? What can you do about it? What does knowing this truth do for you? How does it make your life any better? I can certainly tell you how it makes your life worse, but how does it make it better? What can you do with it? Because you can't convince anyone. You may take to the streets in a soapbox and you may be that crazy homeless person who is truly a prophet, <laughs> who is speaking truth, but no one pays attention or cares. So at the end of the day, we have to look at all of these systems as saying, and all of these questions of how does this help me on my path? Which then the question is, well, what is my path? And within masonry, the path is clearly pointed out in the third degree, which is a death and resurrection ritual. You know, we are to prepare ourselves so that we may be useful here on earth to our fellow human beings. And we are to become a block in the temple of the grand architect, whatever that happens to be. But that block, that symbolism of the smooth ashlar is a very interesting one because the stone is hard. The stone is smooth, meaning it can fit in anywhere. All the rough edges are gone. It's in a sense, very adaptable. It's useful in many places and positions and locations, not just one. And in a sense, it's unlimited. Being firm and strong as stone is, it also means that it can withstand the pressure of those things around it, as well as support them. And, you know, that is what our purpose here is in our metaphysical pursuits, is to create a sense of self that is firm and strong and can withstand the pressures of the knot from which we have come. I mean, um, <clears throat> earlier on, we we touched upon the Illuminati, and I think it's actually more interesting. You know, truth is is often stranger than and more interesting than fiction. Um, but I'd like to discuss the kind of uh, the links between the you know, the real links <laughs> between the Illuminati, the real Illuminati, and the and Freemasonry, because you know, my understanding is there is a, there was an inception at least at one point of the Illuminati into Freemasonry and invo involved Cagliostro and uh, 
and very you know various others i was wondering if you could talk to that i can't i've never really followed that line up too much i know there's a wonderful book that just came out that you and i both got our copies of mine just came about 10 minutes before the show <laughs> yeah uh, and it's a, it's a doorstop. It's it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, remember, this was a different time. You had secret societies because it was dangerous to, to meet in the open. You had uh, men and to some degree some women, uh, particularly in Kaigoster's Egyptian right. Uh, they were dealing with governments that were police states. I mean, day to day for the average person, it was okay. You did your job, you, you know, you did your work, paid your taxes, not much was, you know, to worry about. But you didn't try to change anything. You know, you watched what you published. And if not, you end up in, in prison. And for an uncertain period of time. So all of these royal families, which is what they were, they were royalty, they were, they ran uh, you know, semi-feudal police states, for lack of a better description in modern language. And many of these people were trying to change that. And you didn't change that overnight, and you didn't change it quickly, and you had to be very careful, because a lot of people had a great deal to lose. And things could go very badly, as we saw with the French Revolution. That went very, very badly. So if you're going to get intelligentsia behind you with some degree of secrecy and have international contacts, there was no better mechanism than masonry. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I've always just found it quite an interesting kind of um, area of, uh, you know, of, of history in general. You know, you also have the um, elusive alchemical Count San Germain involved with this whole period of time as well. And um, I, I, I don't know if you ever looked into him at all. We we did a show on him recently. Well, Saint Germain is a an interesting fellow, and probably the best book written about him was by uh, who was it? The Comte de Saint Germain, the last scion of the House of Rakosi, by Jean Overton Fuller. Oh yes, that's probably the best book on him, if you can find it. Uh you know, and of course, he was from Hungarian, Transylvanian birth. I always find that interesting. It's almost like uh, Count Dracula was his counterpart in some regards, the <laughs> evil alchemist. Uh, but within that framework, of course, he's taken to Italy. He's raised there by family. He, he has access to fe spectacular education and wealth. And uh, he goes off and, and, and does whatever this mission is that he does. We, we don't really know. And I, and I, and I think it's really uh, silly to, to attempt to, to say we know. Uh, I do believe that there are some folks who do know and uh, that he was an alchemist and that he had tremendous capacity for transmutation. I know. Uh, Jean Dubuis, the, the French alchemist who, who founded the Philosophers of Nature, who I knew, um, fortunately, as uh, he would say that uh, Saint Germain's uh, transmutations, uh, you know, that he could make diamonds. And uh, I think that when we look at someone like that, it's very difficult to understand what we're talking about. So we have people who want to turn him into a kind of comic book superhero, which is what uh, the theosophists do, and, and then Amorc to some degree after that. A lot of the writings in the late 19th, early 20th century tend to do that. Or they want to reduce him to very quantifiable understandings. Uh, some recent biographies on Paracelsus are like that. We simply don't know what they were doing. No, it's interesting that you bring up um, theosophy, because obviously theosophy um, intersects uh, at some point, especially in the kind of uh, revival periods of masonry. And I was wondering, yeah, that, I mean, obviously Blavatsky um, was allegedly met 
uh, Saint Germain, but there is this uh, theosophical kind of um, crossroads, isn't there, with uh, theosophy and Freemasonry, and in particular, co-masonry was a, a, a kind of fallout from that crossover. Could uh, could you talk a bit about theosophy and it, and and Freemasonry? Well, of course, you know, Saint Germain was involved in Masonic circles. We have him attending Masonic conventions and some knowledge of that. I think there's some verification of that. Of course, what was the purpose? We don't know. And of course, following on his heels is Cagliostro, which is uh, a series of, of interesting contradictions. But we move forward into theosophy and you know, Blavatsky's great claim, of course, was contact with her invisible masters, her great white brotherhood, and whatever that happened to be. So at some point in the theosophical movement, and I don't know when, I'd have to look it up, but I know it's in the book, uh, co-masonry becomes a, a force. And what, what the, why this is interesting is because this was a Masonic body that was overtly esoteric and it was for both men and women. It wasn't just uh, male only. And the reason for the male only is often given because of some of the uh, partial ritual nudity, just for those who are wondering, that takes place in the first degree, the bearing of the breast. You know, how would you do that in polite circles with women? Okay, so to clear that point up. Now, co-masonry is a organization that your listeners can easily look up today. And uh, they may very easily join a lodge should they desire it. It exists, it's out there, and there are many groups and affiliated groups, at least in the United States that I've seen. So it is uh, a movement that is clearly Masonic and very, and works Masonic degrees and is very esoteric in its understanding of those degrees and its nature. And that was somewhat typical because this is now taking place at the time of the occult revival. So we also see various groups of Martinism. In Martinism, there's uh, Gerard and Cous, Papus, he had a secret dream that Martinism would become the capstone of Masonry, supplanting the 32nd degree of and all of that, and that never happened. Thank God. Uh, and then, of course, we see various Rosicrucian groups coming up in France, uh, Peladon's uh, Catholic Rose Croix or Universal Rose Croix, uh, which continues to this day. We see the Rose Croix Kabbaliste, which continues to this day. And uh, we see various offshoots of that, of which the most famous and infamous for some, but influential clearly on a worldwide basis, at least as far as the 20th century goes, would be the ancient mystical order Rosicrucius or Amorc out of San Jose, California. And that has a somewhat of a Masonic structure to it in terms of degrees. It has nine degrees. Uh, basic degrees. That's 12 in total, but th that's another story. And, you know, these degrees have names that are very similar or identical to what you would find in uh, either the Golden Dawn's degrees or in the uh, uh, Society of Rosicrucica degrees, SRIA degrees. So a lot of overlap and cross-fertilization and just outright copying was going on. And Amwork has a little bit of a homage to Egyptian masonry, too, as well, a little bit. Hmm. And my understanding is um, also as well, you've got the uh, that um, those influences of uh, masonry and um, alchemy in um, Fucanelli's The Brotherhood of he Heliopolis. And he explores, you know, um, masonry in a literal sense in terms of like Notre Dame from a sort of alchemical point of view. So there's a kind of, I mean, a, a Freemasonic sort of g glue in there somewhere, isn't there? Well, there must be because we're talking literally about buildings and then about alchemy. And so there's a, that's in there somewhere. Well, correct. And that's the great part. And we have to ask where. Because we have these buildings of the cathedrals, 
and we have the building guilds, of which Masonry says it goes back to the medieval builders guilds as its myth mythic history. And they're building these spectacular cathedrals. Now, how much of Falconelli is correct is, is anyone's guess, but it's a great story. Oh, yeah. And it's, and it's a sp spectacular idea, because even if he's in error, if it's just his fantasy of what he's seeing, what he wants to see, because it's easy. It's all religious symbolism, so it'd be very easy to see it. Uh, it almost would be impossible not to make the connections. Even if the connections aren't intentional, they can still be there and still be effective because that's the way how archetypes work. Archetypes work, they don't work in a linear fashion, they work in an associative fashion. So we see then the nature of what is the role of architect and institutions. And, you know, we create our institutions, as a friend of mine says, we shape our institutions and then they shape us. And going back to guarding well the Western Gate, that's institutions are also made up of people and places and the things that they do there or hold there. So you will become like, and this is why the fraternity is so important, you'll become like the people you spend the most time with. So if you spend your time with people who are helpful and kind and generous and philosophical and outgoing, you'll become like that. If you spend people time with people who are unconcerned with uh, those questions, you'll become like that. And if you spend your time with people who are criminals, you will become like them. Why do you think cops become so jaded and corrupt at times? And I've known a lot of police. I worked in housing. You know, that's why I say that. Why do you think social workers become so broken? Because they spend all their time with broken, addicted, criminal, one you know, combination of all of the above people. Those, those things are contagious on a psychic level, psychic contagion. That's what we talked about in the book on egregores. That's what we say, pick your friends carefully. Yeah, you are the company you keep. You're, yeah, your grandmother, your mother was right. Your grandmother's right. I'll know you by your friends. And we know there's certain exceptions to that, but for the most part, it's true. Yes, yeah. I'm, 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 I regard myself as very blessed with my friends, so... So, um, I mean, one on you know, continuing on the subject of the esoteric, I suppose, um, one of the most uh, important, I'd say, more modern um, esoteric offshoots of the of Freemasonry is the Golden Dawn. Um, you know, that that you could argue they've their you know their influence on Western es esotericism in particular is, you know, it's unparalleled in many ways. Um, could you? perhaps talk about the golden dawn a little bit and um more importantly kind of uh I, i've always been interested in the relationship between the golden dawn and freemasonry on a, on a literal level you know was there a relationship obviously the members were co-members but did freemasonry in any way recognize the golden dawn or, or did the golden, golden dawn even sort of um intend to try and be recognized by freemasonry or you know official on an official capacity or that I can't answer. I don't know, but I don't believe it did. I mean, we know that the founding members were all Freemasons and many of the members were Masons. Uh, however, I do, I do know that in the uh, publication, The New Age, which was a Masonic publication in the 1920s, and I had a copy of this one in particular, and I, I remember picking it up because uh, it specifically stated the Golden Dawn as an organization to stay away from, warning its members against. And I think there we have that point of not understanding esotericism. And the Golden Dawn, of course, its influence on occultism is unparalleled. I have to, and even pop culture is unparalleled. I think Amwork, however, is a larger deeper and more pervasive influence. And I, I've gotten into that in other, other shows as to why. But I, I think it's because, and both of them have, again, 
either a direct connection or a pseudo connection to masonry, the lodge structure, the nature of degrees, secret wisdom being transmitted. Everything is very, very similar. What makes the Golden Dawn special, truly is special, is the body of techniques or methods which it produced in terms of ritual that had not existed prior to it. The suggestion is there. And if we read Agrippa, we can even see again some ideas suggesting it is there, but the actual rituals aren't there. And those rituals would later go on to influence, again, as we've seen the OTO, but also modern witchcraft, modern Wicca, many neo-pagan groups, and a host of other esoteric movements. And in fact, it, it, one becomes very hard pressed today to find a magical movement in existence that is not in some way uh, a variation of the Golden Dawn rituals. Yeah, I mean, the way I, I tend to look at it, and I, uh, I might be wrong here, is that you've got like regular Freemasonry, and then you've got, but you've got this thing, the, it, the, the Masonic landscape and mushrooming and you know in the hinter in in the undergrowth are yes. these are these like mushrooming these like little fertile things popping up and they they have their roots in in, in masonry of some sort or another and it's in the you can see it in them but they sort of take masonry and they sort of like it sprouts off in this you know it sort of well, eccentric well here part. it's specifically the Ros rosicrucian college uh, which is invitation only. I, I was given an invitation to one of our colleges probably 15 years ago or so, and I declined only because of distance. It was just like a, a three and a half hour drive to get to meetings and that, that wasn't going to happen. So I said, it's be better to decline than to accept something that I can't participate in. And I, I was honest about it. I said, thank you very much, but I can't make it. But there the distance was much shorter and these people were making it to their Masonic bodies. They were making it to their meetings. Uh, they were going for these high grade, these proliferations, which have both strengths and weaknesses. And uh, here was the Rosicrucian colleges, which were the college, which was most influential in, in helping to shape the golden dawn. And uh, I don't believe it ever sought official recognition because I don't think it ever needed it. It was too busy. Uh, McGregor Mathers and company were too busy growing their organization. And it, I'm sure that they would have accepted it had it been offered, uh, like uh, Nkusa, Papus, you know, he wanted Martinism to become this crown jewel of masonry. Uh, I think that was a bit ambitious and unnecessary, and it didn't happen. But masonry was very protective then, as it is now, and even more so then, if they thought you were trying to... Uh, uh, I don't want to say stage a coup, but I think you get the idea, somehow take things over, uh, you could very quickly, you know, be shown the curb. Yeah. I'm, I must mention this. I can't possibly not mention it, but uh, I in in I've I've managed over the very I'm very privileged actually to have these. But I I found a collection of, of old books, which uh, some obviously well established. Freemason must have collected over the years, and um, and their emphasis is definitely on the, the towards the hermetic side, the esoteric side of things, and I there were publications of this um, uh, quite a modest looking sort of organ um, actually called the Transactions of the Masonic Study Society. Oh, those you know those are boring titles, and you and you find these boring things in there like some minutes of this meeting, minutes of that meeting. And often buried in there are some really spectacular articles. Oh in yeah, those, yeah. In those various minutes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. In those transactions, I mean. Yeah. And, well, and if, if you just, I don't want to cut you off, but if you if you get a copy of some of the even newer ritual ritual booklets, like we would use in Scottish Rite, uh, there'll be no, notes in the back about Kabbalah and alchemy. It's clearly stated. If 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 you have a if you have a Masonic Bible. Uh, I don't have mine in reach, otherwise I'd read off what the publishing company is. There's a whole index of words in the beginning, which has Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, 
Kabbalah. <laughs> and I'd open the Bible and I'd point this out to the brethren. I'd say, guys, did you read your Bible? Yeah. I mean, this this group, uh, these, these transactions of the Masonic Studies Society, um, they clearly were very passionate about that aspect of things and they and in the ones i've got i've got ones from the 70s and and a few from the 80s i don't even know if it survived or even if, even if that organization exists anymore but they have in them they somebody has sort of uh, reproduced the catabolistic tree of life and, and placed the landmarks of masonry freemasonry as they see it on upon the sephiroth uh, they talk about, um, you know, in the great Masonic Hall in London, the, on Queen Street, I believe it is, you know, you, you step over a pentagram to get in and you're, you're, under it, you're under its protection. And they relate that explicitly to uh, Golden Dawn rituals. It's, it's, it's really fascinating how uh, there was clearly a, a group of people who, within um, regular masonry, who who had that very strong emphasis, that strong interest, and and was and more meeting and studying from that particular perspective. And therein lies the beauty of masonry as a big umbrella, a big tent. That in an ideal situation, that is not only capable but it happens right alongside men who simply don't care and they're there for fraternity or to do some charitable work or maybe to get out of the house for a night and uh right there at next door is another group who are concerned with the deepest mysteries of uh the human psyche and yeah. life itself yeah i mean even the uh this this uh, sort of body, the Masonic Study Society, their their emblem, which is, is printed on these, uh, you know, they're they're modest pamphlets, but like I say, they got some fascinating, you know, they got some fascinating impl implications and material in them actually, and uh, their their emblem is uh, the Ouroboros, and mm -hmm. a lamp, a lit lamp with the. Um, the uh, M Masonic Study Society, the initials sort of emblazoned on that. Even that in itself is, you know, it's it's such a rich, intriguing thing. So intriguing. I mean, you know, totally intriguing. Well, therein lies the beauty of, of the Masonic path is that it is uh, wide and varied and has many offshoots. And uh, why it's such a fascinating organization and again, uh, it, the book that I wrote, The Path of Freemasonry, is not just about masonry, it's about the Masonic view, so that one can be a brother or sister without apron, if you will, who understands the, the, the fundamental philosophical and spiritual views, because our spiritual experiences, our experiences are what we take with us, and those are going to be based upon our philosophical foundation. What is our view? What do we see ourselves as being and being potential of? And in that sense, we are self-created or self-creating creatures. And this goes back to, uh, and I think we mentioned it earlier, you know, Alephus Levy and his definition of the great work of, you know, we are uh, self-created beings in which we, we, we take the kingdom of heaven by storm. Yeah, we are, we are creature and creators, uh, Nietzsche once wrote and uh, and levy eliphas levy i mean he himself uh, he, uh, my understanding is that he joined the masons at some point the freemasons and he wrote uh he must be one of the first writers uh, all of the yeah one of the most earliest writers who wrote specifically with that sort of uh uh, hermetic view of masonry and, the, and my understanding is he joined in order to try to revive that or try to re reignite that interest that aspect of it oh well i'm sure he did and, and that was that was a drive in many people's reasons for joining masonry and that's an unfortunate one because it, it doesn't happen uh, you can, what I have found is that one meets a wonderful bunch of people in masonry and that some of those brethren may be involved in other esoteric movements that are similar to it, but you rarely find, uh, an esoteric masonry. I mean, co-masonry is a, an example, but, uh, within what we would call regular masonry, it's rare. You know, this notion of truly esoteric action 
similar to what you might find in the Golden Dawn taking place in a Masonic Lodge. Uh, I've not seen it. I think the only one I've seen in, you know, local to us, where there was a recent revival of the Memphis Misere uh, in London. Um, I only know about that because we know one of the founding, founding yes, members personally. But yeah. And that's Memphis Mislame. That's even a whole other ball game altogether. You can depends on what jurisdiction you're in. You may that may get you kicked out of regular masonry associating with Memphis Mislame, depending on where you're at, for different reasons. Why? Why is that? I, I mean, I I know somewhat about the Memphis Mislame, but it's, it's a it's a term you hear a lot. But could you maybe go into that a bit? It's like what? what? Well, it's Egyptian masonry. It's mostly Italian. But it's, you know, what we associate with Cagliostro. And um, it's an organization, you know, so there's different people in charge of different jurisdictions. And they may have different uh, agendas on their own. I, I've known several people in it here in the United States. It never really took off in the U.S., you know, the leadership was never able to get it off the ground. However, that's not the same elsewhere. Other places, it's done very well. And it's taken off very well. I'm not particularly familiar with all of its contents, but it. what I have been told is that some of the degree work, the aspects have to deal with the what I had mentioned earlier, the survival and continuity of consciousness you know what we think of as immortality so it has a, a tremendous amount of alchemical and uh, kabbalistic work within it and in theory from an egyptian framework although that may not always be the case at least from what i've seen mm, interesting I, I um you know uh we're, obviously we've uh, taken up a lot of your time uh, the, i would like to just touch on one last particular point and that was uh the gerald gardner connection um uh with with freemasonry we sort of mentioned it earlier um i was wondering if you could talk to that because it is interesting wiccans in particular seem to be very uh, oh yeah i wish you to gave me this question ahead of time i would have researched it better because I, <laughs> I, I i had a couple of books on gardner in my hand just a few days ago and i said oh i'll get to these later <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I which which ones I read them just out of curiosity sorry just out of curiosity which ones were they Oh, I don't even remember uh, because I, I was shuffling through a stack. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know how that is. You're shuffling, trying to organize the pile better so it doesn't fall over as quickly on you. <laughs> I mean, what what little I understand, apart from the he he was an um, uh, entered apprentice, and um, he also um, was a friend. Which, which, just for the clarification of listeners, that means he never became a master mason. No. However, he would have been exposed to the most. Uh, one of the most fascinating uh, aspects of Masonic symbolism, truly fascinating, you would have seen uh, at that stage in his lodge. And it would have given him a sense of ritual that one sees embodied in Wicca. I can see the parts that are, are, are carried out there. Uh, and again, this, this changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it's the ritual binding the blindfolding, the escorting, all of that is part of the entered apprentice ritual. And it uh, it's just when it when the whole thing is on uh, reaches its climax, its point of completion. It has just a, a spectacular uh, impact on the candidate emotionally, emotionally. So I, I can see where a lot of that early ritual work is, 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 and he could have found that, by the way, he could easily have found that in some, what were called exposés, Masonic expose was a, of ritual that would have been published. Yeah. And, and also my, my understanding is of um, Gardner, another influence from the Masonic side of things is that he was uh, a close associate of uh, um, uh, a Masonic scholar called J.S.M. Ward, and um, J.S.M. Ward, um, he wrote a book called um, "Who Was Here Am Abeth," and uh, and but J.S.M. Ward was involved in lots of different things. He was very interested in um, preserving old buildings, for example, mm -hmm. and um, the famous uh, what Gerald Gardner came to call the the witch's cottage at 
Brickett Wood, yes. where he did all the initiations. That originally was preserved by J.S.M. Ward. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, so there's that, yes. And so there's that that, that uh, link again with that. How is that cottage? Was there a fire there or a flood? A flood a few years back, if I remember correctly. My understanding is it's still there, but it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit uh, beaten up and um, unloved. But it's, it's still there. That's unfortunate. I hope they I hope they can preserve it. You know, getting a little off track. We have a, a conference every year here, the Institute for Medic Studies, uh, and we're in northeastern PA. And uh, this year in in when we have our conference in May, we're going to be having the uh, director of the Raymond Buckland uh, Museum of Witchcraft. He's coming out from Cleveland to uh, present. So I'm kind of looking forward to uh, seeing what he has to say and, and getting some more insight about their, their operation, their displays and their collection. I think it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Why do you think it is Wiccans in particular seem so adverse to this kind of connection with, with Freemasonry? They, they in particular, whenever I've spoken to Wiccans about this, they really, really have a kind of uh, vehement... Uh, I'll, bl- I'll blame it on Z Budapest, just out of convenience. <laughs> I, and I think I say that half jokingly, but when we look at the movement, when we look at the early witchcraft movement in the 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, particularly Sybil Leak, who used to visit here regularly, uh, which was a big deal. It would make it in the newspapers even. And <laughs> I was talking to some youngins the other day, and of course, transplants to the area, who because uh, they never know the history. They, they rarely bother to learn it. And uh, I said, well, you realize that you know who Sybil Leak is, right? And of course, uh, yeah, I'm Sybil Leak. Yeah. Okay, so Diary of a Witch and all that. I said, well, well, she used to visit the area regularly, and, and she would go with see Dr. Frederick Santee in Wap Wallopin, which is, uh, you know, boondocks as you can get. And uh, I said, and, and of course, you know, his coven, Coven of the Cata, was featured on the History Channel. I, I, I did some of the, uh, the, the work on that. You can see a younger version of me there. But more importantly, there's online, you can find photographs. You couldn't, you know, when I did that, you couldn't find them. They're hard to find. But also articles that appeared in the Bloomsburg newspaper, the Witch's Corner, I think it was called, that the column which ran for years, where one of his students or two of his students would, would write these columns about uh, health and nutrition and a little bit of witchcraft or folklore. And so this whole notion of witchcraft as a persecuted entity begins to fall apart, you know, in in light of that. I mean, we're talking, you know, central and rural Pennsylvania here. And I I jokingly say it's not that we uh, do witchcraft or magic better here uh, than you guys do in California or New York. Uh, We've just been doing it longer. Uh, Oh, no, no, that's wrong. We've been doing it longer and we do it better. Uh, because there's a culture of it that goes back hundreds of years. But but when you move into Wicca and you turn it away from witchcraft and magic, which uh, there's some really powerful goetic and grimoiric and, and demonical elements in that, and they want to ignore that. They want to pretend that's not there. Okay. And they want to turn it completely into a, the old religion reborn. And they want to turn it into a religion of worship rather than magic, which we have to make a distinction of magic being operational and and magic being devotional, or excuse me, religion being devotional. Uh, When we do that, then you have to uh, recreate a mythos. And that mythos was heavily politicized uh, under feminism, and uh, really, you know, yeah, that, that would be probably the strongest one. But uh, some very strong political movement, you know, notions got infused into the movement. And that's where you see where Wicca over time and most of these movements, the OTO now and a lot of other groups just solely degraded into liberal political action committees as opposed to being operative entities of education and self-development and self-awareness. So their attention got turned around instead of being focused within in one's own becoming, it gets turned without and gets involved in social action. And at that part, they all fall apart. 
I mean, that's happened to the mainstream churches. That's why they collapsed too. Yeah. And begins to replace it. Yeah, I mean, without without light and shade, there is no depth, and that's that's true of of art, and it's true of life, and it's true of everything else. To be fair, I mean, I'm I'm no Wiccan. I, I you know, I'm um, I'm can be further from it, but I've met a, a few in my time. I've met a a few uh, Bricket Wood um, Coven members, and they're the ones I've met at least. Their their take their take on the Freemasonic crossover is actually is, is actually quite fair and, and quite objective isn't it? I, I think one of the other aspects too has to do with as it becomes more politicized and the anti Christian and Catholic in particular rhetoric ramps up within the Wiccan movement uh, coupled with that really idiotic statement we are not Satanists Okay, great. That 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 really didn't that cleared the waters a lot, uh, as I, I like to tell them. Uh, tell us what you are, not what you aren't. Uh, coupled with the satanic panic of the '80s and early '90s, uh, there was just kind of this wholesale uh, hyper feminizing of it. It became a movement that was specifically marketed towards teenage girls and young women. Not much, you know, not very different from the way most magical texts, particularly Crowley, O.T.O., Kabbalah, is marketed towards 15 to 28-year-old men. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. Um, uh, I, I thought we'd uh, finish off with, I mean, in the last time we had you on, um, we spoke about uh, uh, Mr. James Wasserman, um, who wrote the foreword to Egregores. I was just wondering, because if we've had him as a guest on the show so often, I, I, I would... I'd like you to talk about your uh, relationship with Lon Milo Duquette, uh, a good friend of ours. Um, you know, uh, he, he, wrote, he wrote the introduction to the Path of Freemasonry, one of the introductions, I should say. Um, can you talk about your relationship with Lon? And um, yeah, that would be great to hear. Mm. Well, my relationship with Lon is is somewhat uh, unusual. I mean, I, I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the OTO, but we would run across each other at conferences and. I read his book, My Life with the Spirits, which was very fascinating and funny and in some ways similar to my own. We had a lot of similar experiences. And um, his book on Enochian magic, his new one, not new one, uh, new it, it's not that new, maybe it's about 10 years old now, um, which takes kind of a traditional approach, uh, has this little footnote in there. And, and it's clear. I mean, it says, you know, uh, I'd like to thank Christos Pierre for the uh, notes on Inaki and that made this book possible. It was from a uh, seminar that he gave in Pittston, Pennsylvania, and, and it gives the, the year and everything. And, and that was a seminar that we had sponsored. I, I was involved in setting that up and, and making that happen. So, you know, I've had this connection with Juan in different mechanisms and ways, and we've spoken on the phone, and uh, I was asked to write some stuff for one of his books, and and I asked him to write this for mine, and, uh, and I found him to be a, a very enjoyable and uh, a very humorous and pleasant and uh, uh, informative uh, person. And um, I, I think that, uh, you know, his, his take is a very lighthearted, but still serious in terms of how he approaches uh, his understanding of, of all of this magic. Now, of course, it, it is, again, mostly geared towards an OTO or, or, or as I say, a Crowleyite thelemic perspective. Uh, and I'm OK with that. Uh, I just don't. Uh, I just don't follow it in, in myself. My relationship with with James Wasserman was was probably closer. We spoke on the phone more often, and uh, had very a variety of more projects involved. And I think we knew more of the same people within the publishing realm, so we were a little closer there. Oh, that's great. So last time you were on, you were talking about um, some of your new uh, projects. One was with I can't remember the name of the Anathema, wasn't it? I think. Um, how's that coming along? And you know, when when do you think we'll be seeing that? I I'm, I understand it'll be at the mid the fall or winter of this year. It'll be near the end of this year. It is a wonderful Masonic sounding title, Order Out of Chaos. It's going to be two volumes, hardcover, deluxe, with spectacular artwork, which uh, I'm just thrilled to see. 
And it's uh, a series of essays that I wrote over a period of two years. So it's, it's fairly comprehensive on various aspects of uh, esotericism and, and, and practical work. I, I hate to call it an advanced book. Uh, everyone likes to say that phrase. I, I look at, at it more as, as I said earlier, like in Scottish Rite. You know, everyone's a master mason, but what we're looking at now is we're, we're going back over the same material, but with a different perspective. And I think that's what I, the way I'd like to say what order out of chaos is. It looks at taking a lot of these ideas that we hear about in esotericism and finding some very, very practical ways of dealing with them or using them in our day-to-day -day life to get our lives together. Because that's why we undertake occult practices to begin with, because we don't like our lives. If we did, we wouldn't undertake them. We're trying to make sense or bring order to that chaos, which is our life. So there's some very good methods in there. And uh, one of them, one of the essays is a very lengthy one. It's on the, na the nature of willpower. What is will? We hear about this all the time in occultism and yoga and all these things. And, and it was really nice to hear that uh, one of our board members, who is a Jungian therapist and uh, a PhD in philosophy and a professor in philosophy, he wrote his dissertation on will, and he said this is probably the best paper he's ever read on it. And these, the approach throughout the books is designed to be practical. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very easy to read without being uh, silly or stupid approach to some very difficult ideas that have deep meaning in our lives fantastic and did you I've, i think you mentioned um you might have had some other projects on the go as well uh, could you talk about those at all? oh we've always got things we have our conference in may uh we have to uh you know that's going to be both live and uh telebroadcast or you know live streamed in some fashion and we have uh publications always coming out of old essays. I mean, I've been writing for so many years that uh, it, it's time to get a lot of those essays out of the drawers, uh, find out which ones are going to survive another decade and which ones are going to disappear into the into the good night and uh, get them published in some kind of uh, uh, form. So that's where a lot of our work is going. And at the Institute for Hermetic Studies, we've also initiated this year uh, our first class of uh, teacher trainees. So esotericism continues as a tradition. And while that tradition can be soft or strong or in between, it requires continuity. That's what tradition is, continuity across generations. So we have eight uh, men and women who have volunteered to participate in this program. And they're getting their, their feet wet in terms of what does it really mean to want to help instruct others in oh, an esoteric path. And uh, you do you run online courses, yeah. don't you, as well, um, on te te Teachable? Yeah, That is correct, through Teachable. Your listeners can just find the Institute for Hermetic Studies online at teachable.com. And we have a host of courses they can sign up for. And our introductory course unfolding the rose is six hours plus additional material we'll be adding more shortly we're going to be adding some brief five and ten minute videos from our teacher trainees we're going to add those to it too and uh, that's for free you just sign up for that and no cost to you excellent and we will put a link to that again in the uh, in the notes of this show uh thanks so much for coming back on um uh it's it's always a pleasure and i'm already thinking of excuses to try and get you back on again soon <laughs> <laughs> but, well we'll do uh we'll do something like uh between the gates so we'll have some mm. fun with that maybe yeah that sounds great excellent thank you so much yes thank, well, thank you. you very much yes thank you for your words and your thoughts and and your time again and we are back that was quite a cool episode i enjoyed that um mark is always uh um you know a, a very interesting guest a very very giving with information and uh very conversational wouldn't you say oh absolutely and i think he represents well the 
the book um, that we were sort of uh, focusing on today, which I, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to uh, recommend to those who are interested in Freemasonry, particularly from his, that sort of uh, the uh, hermetic uh, sort of mystery perspective mm. or approach. Yeah, I mean, and don't forget, uh, check out his um, his course on Teachable. If you come to citynow.co.uk after entering the uh, Tobias Churton competition on episode 60, you can also check out the links to the free course that he mentions. I had a quick look at it, and it actually looks really interesting, um, especially, if, you know, if someone dipping into the kind of uh, esoteric world, it's definitely a good uh, primer, I would say, uh, for that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's... It, I, I i get the impression we could probably have spoken about freemasonry for uh quite a long time uh, and gone down many different alleyways wouldn't you say absolutely you could have a whole podcast dedicated to um you know the the the, the rich flora and fauna of the masonic landscape and uh, and its various various forms there probably are podcasts yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i just don't yeah, know about not them, as good but... as not as good as this one well, i mean naturally, not, naturally no i mean there's a i mean it's appropriate enough because you know that there, there's a great deal of craft i must say can you put a great deal of craft into the the podcast <laughs> oh, thank you very much the hand of the the invisible hand of the craftsman is at work so you know the the sort of you know the sort of crude gristle of 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 banter is is sort of cut to the lean meat of, of debate. <laughs> I, I think I notice I get excised a lot <laughs> from it, and uh, and you know, witty all I've quite a few of my witty, you know, sort of reposts and and bon mots and uh, scintillating insights that end up on the uh, cutting room floor, so to speak. Lost gems, I like to think of them. <laughs> like, Lost gems, of which I must say, it's a, it's an act of cultural vandalism on par with the <laughs> the, the burning of the uh, the the library of Alexandra, but we, we won't linger on that <laughs> unsavory that unsavory vision and uh, but, but uh, yeah, you know it's uh, yeah excellent yeah it's uh, yeah, anyway uh, on that kind of uh, <laughs> on that note um, do follow us on YouTube uh, si uh, at oh, it's not at is it it's YouTube so it's just sitting now uh, one word S I W T I N G N O W uh, Instagram sitting now at sitting now see that's where the at is. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Sitting Now, surprise, surprise. And of course, online at our mothership, uh, sittingnow.co.uk. Uh, we're coming back next week, I believe, with Carl Abrahamson uh, to talk about uh, a satanic character. And anyway, we shall see you next week.